Hello everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Now we are sitting down with Spiros Kouvelis. Hey, Alan. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Woo, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, so we are still at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software. Spiros is the former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greece. He is also the Program Director for the Center of Sustainable Development Goals at the University of Cambridge. And that is awesome. I mean, I, oh. I'm so excited to talk about this because the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN have been so important to me. And now hearing that there's other efforts in Europe that are really focused around all this, you've been teaching me about the little review system test that's been going on to see how oh, that works. Teaching is too much to say, but <laughs> let me first of all say just for, for the record that the, the center is a joint effort between the University of Cambridge. University of Cambridge has a special program on sustainability leadership. And I helped develop a joint program between the University of Cambridge and the European Public Law Organization, which is an international mm -hmm. body working on governance and public law issues. Yes. And I'm directing this joint program. Um, and I was not teaching you anything. You seem to no, know quite a lot was. of stuff about the SDGs. <laughs> but for the sake of those who are not very familiar, let yeah. me just say that in, the, in September 2015, all the countries of the United Nations, which is quite an exceptional thing, you don't have things being voted by all the countries of the UN, came together and decided that humanity has to move, uh, move on and adopted 17 goals that are the goals that will hopefully lead humanity into sustainable development. Things so, like no poverty, no famine, um, and a clean energy for everybody. Education, clean, clean education. energy, protection of the oceans, climate change, yeah. um, agriculture, food, you name it, everything. One of those goals is number 17 actually is the last one and it's about how we'll make it happen by involving everyone. Yeah. And this is where governance comes in the picture. Yeah. Because unless you manage to find a way to bring all the different sides of, of human development uh, together, you will be actually running like, you know, chasing your, your cue, as we say in my language in mm. Greek. It just, your tail. Your tail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so we established a center because we want to find ways to help both the private sector and the public sector to address those goals, find ways to implement yes. them, and we realize that it's quite a, a high call. It's not an easy it thing. Is. It's, it's not. Because we're trying to get private sector, we're trying to get government, and then we're trying to get scientists and technologists to also exactly. work within this pie. And how do we get them all to work together in Greece? But then how is it different for the Dominican Republic? How is it different for um, Taiwan? You know, it's so much different across different parts of the world. And so, uh, and so how do we create these systems and how do we maybe make a, a, a tool set that can be available for a country that's like, I want to be work on our sustainable development goals. And it's like, oh, this, here's how you get scientists and technologists involved with the private sector, with the government. So that's well, so important. I'll tell you a story, short story, uh, about how this center was created. Um, back in 2015, if I remember, 14, 15, I was working with the United Nations as an advisor and we, we created what we call the Mediterranean Strategy for Sustainable Development. So 25 countries around the Mediterranean decided that they wanted to have a strategy, a common strategy, again, getting countries to agree around the Mediterranean, not being an automatic thing. Um, and they did develop this, this strategy. It was voted by all of them, adopted, and they had to implement it. And then they asked us uh, to find a way so that we would do a peer review, so that each country would be reviewing the others and see how, in fact, they, in reality, they do implement those, those goals. Um, so we devised a strategy that we call the simplified peer review mechanism in which the central idea was that no country would only be reviewed. So a country would review the others and would be reviewed by others. And the first three you countries... You review three and you'd get reviewed by three? Uh, no, the three countries that participate, so the two are reviewing the third one and it goes around. Oh. So okay. everyone is at the same time a reviewer and you, a review. You review two and you get reviewed by two. By two, exactly. Okay. Um, and so the first three countries that we did were also very interesting geographically because we had France, very big G7 mm -hmm. country. We had Morocco, North Africa, mm -hmm. um, rich country with a very um, forward-thinking leadership under the, the King Mohammed VI, mm -hmm. uh, and Montenegro, very small country that mm -hmm. came out of the dissolution of ex-Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. um, 
It was interesting. We learned a lot of things, but the most interesting thing that we saw was that no matter what the size of the country or the public administration, they were facing exactly the same problem. And when I say the size, compare, for example, that in France we had about 20,000 people working in the headquarters of the Ministry of Environment and Ecology. In Montenegro you had about 20 people. <laughs> so the scale was very different. And still they were facing exactly the same problem, which was our policies are sectoral, so you have a policy for agriculture, you have a policy for transportation, you have a policy for food, a policy for energy and so on. And there is no way you can get them to cross-refer what they're doing to work together. So we thought that mm -hmm. if we cannot find a way to improve the governance between them and also how to involve the private sector, business, uh, as you said, technology, science and everyday people, most of all, uh, there is no way we can advance to the point of literally implementing the SDGs. We might implement something which is good for the environment or something which is good for fisheries or something which is good for transportation. But across the board, it will not happen unless we find ways to get them to work all together. And this is what we're focusing very much on. Uh, just to give you an example, because the structure of countries um, not only governments, countries as in their economy and their society are structured like this very often the public, the, 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 the legislation of countries does not allow things to happen in different ways. So it's very deeply rooted in, for example, the constitution of a country. So you have to make very deep changes to make the SDGs be implemented and yeah. this is what we're trying to focus on. So as an example, let's, let's say that um, we're in France and we're observing the way that they're working with transportation and energy and food and education. And then um, they're, they're, they're in these verticals in the political system. And so food doesn't really talk to transportation in the mm -hmm. way that they're trying to solve the food vertical doesn't talk to how transportation is trying to be solved in the vertical yeah. of sustainability. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. and so then the idea is how do you get the best principles from the food one that's trying to solve the food sustainable goal with the best principles of the transportation one? And maybe one can take from the other, one can take from the other, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. that's just France. And then you look at Montenegro and you say, well, how with 20 people can we help change um, and help them? How can they mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. principles mm -hmm. for us and exactly. review each other? Okay, exactly. and this just but, started in 2017 too. Uh, yes, this, this was the agreement between Cambridge and the European Public Law Organization mm -hmm. uh, happened in 2017, so now we're setting up the whole program. We have very, very positive uptake from everyone that we speak with, and now we're trying to build the capacity of all the system, you know, by, by selecting actually people globally who can come and share their knowledge with those that need it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just sharing the knowledge, as we said before, on a different sectoral thing. It's, it's more than this. Let me give you an example, uh, which also will help you maybe understand a bit why I am at COFES. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I'm yeah. not a tec technical person. I mean, I, I have nothing to do with technology. When I came here, I didn't think I would understand anything those people say, actually. But it was much, much better than that. I, yeah. I took away so much information and, and, and uh, insight from all that, that these people shared here at COFES. Um, so take a city, okay, let's take any city. And when I say city, imagine that the prediction of the United Nations by 2050 is that we will have around 41 megacities. A megacity is anything bigger than 10 million. Um, in, the, in the Mediterranean, we have already two or three of them. One example is Istanbul, mm -hmm. about uh, 15, 20 million, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Um, Cairo, 25 million, mm -hmm. huge cities. Huge. Now, a city is not just an addition of the buildings, the roads, the bridges, the parks, uh, the water infrastructure, the waste management and all that. It's much more than that because it is a living thing. Yeah. It's a thing that has its own life. Yes. It has influx of food and other resources. It has things that flow Exports, out. Exports, yeah. It's huge. I huge. mean, it's a very, very complicated thing. Yes. Now, if you try to address the problems of a city, and that's just one example, mm -hmm. um, in, in different sectors and say, okay, I will have Allen deal with the roads and then I will have Spiros deal with uh, the buildings and then I will have uh, Christina deal with uh, water management. Eventually, all these people will not be able to collaborate. And the analogy I would mm. give is what we were discussing um, in, mm. in the beginning is if you try to build a human body by designing each of the organs 
separately from the other and then you mm -hmm. cluster them all together and try to find the links to make them work, mm -hmm. it will not work. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have from the outset to start designing the organs or the policies in the case of a city yeah, yeah. or the SDGs yeah. in parallel so that they are made in a way to communicate. Now this is where technology comes in because when you try to get them to communicate the sheer quantity of information of, and complexity you have to take into account is so big that human brain cannot grasp it. It's too much, too much information. It's impossible. All of these different parameters and all of these uncertainties that you have, if one thing changes what happens with everything else, it's impossible for humans to grasp. And this is why humans have devised the way of governance that they have now, which is, you know, vertical and horizontal things so that we have a way to manage it. Enter AI. Artificial intelligence is becoming so strong that it can help us analyze all of this, draw the, the, the conclusions on what works, what doesn't, what are the synthetic and analytical tools that we have to, to put in place, and in that sense becomes, in my view at least, probably the best and only partner that humanity has if, the, if it wants to really be in a position to implement the SDGs. And this mm -hmm. is what I'm taking away from COFIS. Mm -hmm. I see that these people here, they understand very well how the tools they develop can be so strong nowadays and will be becoming much stronger, especially with the machine learning processes that will allow all of these analytical tools to learn as it goes, that it will be able to provide us with, with understanding the complexity of the thing and then put in solutions that can that can coordinate all of these things that need to be happening at the same time. Yeah, um, I really love the analogy to the human body because you can't just work within the transportation vertical or food vertical and then try and figure out, oh, how do we sustainably do this yeah. together? You, we got to build them from the ground up together, from the cell level up, from when you were evolved up. And so that makes a lot of sense with how the human body functions and how the sustainable development goals um, should function because there are there's so many ways that transportation is linked with food, that education is linked with healthcare, um, energy is linked with um, zero emissions and how that's linked to food development, agriculture. So this just it's all so linked together that it's it, you can't we can't just s unlink them and then try and fix them and then try and relink them. Um, exactly. So I'm I mean, glad that that's that, that. If you do that with a human body, the patient, uh, patient is dead. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're trying to avoid it's a mess. here. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the transportation and food. It's very interesting if you think that currently. Uh, about one third of the global food production is wasted. It yeah. never reaches people that need to eat it. Yeah. It's, it's just wasted because the transportation and, and yeah. processing and storage and all that is inefficient. Aesthetics yeah. is one. You look at it and if it, it can't pass a, a, exactly. a looking exactly. test, then... You, yeah. So one third is wasted. Yeah. And, and if we have to deal with the uh, population growth, by 2050, we'll have around 9 billion people yeah. on the planet, yeah. which means we have to, to produce about 60% more food. Now, if we manage to save the one third that is, is wasted, that means that probably it's doable. Yeah. If we don't, yeah. we have a problem. Landfills are disgusting. They are. They're have really, you ever been to one recently? I, I have it's, been to yeah. a landfill. It's really <laughs> fucking bad. It is. It's probably one of the worst things that humanity has done, yeah. is just made trash. A, a, a normal part of our lives. Yes, uh, exactly. We just exactly. the garbage cans there. You throw it away. You forget about it because then later it gets taken to the garbage dump, which then gets shipped off and buried into land. Into land. Buried into land. That is our and, solution right and now. And you bury a thing that is raw materials. It is. It is. It is wealth, actually. What you bury there is wealth because you yeah, can yeah. produce energy, yes. you can produce yes. compost for producing food. Yes. You just throw away yes. uh, your yeah. raw materials. The compost is crazy. There's, in San Francisco, I don't even think twice because in San Francisco we all compost now. So well, I'll uh, tell you yeah. something about but San Francisco that I love. You yeah. know that San Francisco and the Napa Valley produces some of the best wine in the world. You know where the, the um, fertilizers come from? It's compost from yeah. the stuff that yeah. would otherwise be thrown away. So you produce some of the most tasteful and tasty, sorry, and, and, and wonderful wines in the world and, and lots of value added and money into that mm -hmm. by making good use of what otherwise would be just waste. 
And then you Isn't go to clever? other parts of the world where composting is not not being done. People don't care about it. Yeah. It's not, or even um, you know biodegradable polymers is something. The plastic packaging that it, it comes on things is exactly. is currently takes years and years to degrade versus one that could only take a week or two weeks to degrade. But the corporations and shareholders have to be willing to sacrifice a, a small small percentage of the profit to use degradable packaging. But um, this is true if things stay the way they are. But we think that if we, as we said before, we want to get policy making and, and science to work together so that AI and other science can, yeah, we've talked about this. can, can go into this process and help. <clears throat> there are two more very important parts of that. One is business. Uh, if we manage to go into the implementation of the of the sustainable development goals, this is actually I think that creates a lot of good business, good yeah. jobs, and all that. So yeah. the businesses that now would be reluctant to change that because it costs more, if they go into the new model that we yes. want to establish, they actually develop new business. And um, and and lots of people that are young, that are millennials or Gen Z people, will say that, oh look, there's this new company. Exactly. They, you have to move in that direction, or you're going to fall behind. You know what, millennials actually, it's it's a very interesting case where they do grasp the importance of going towards sustainability and uh, for example millennials of, of uh, big family funds and so on they do approach their investment companies now and say we do not mind if our returns on our capital are a bit lower yeah. as long as they are sustainable that's so interesting. because that means not only that they're okay with themselves but the investment they do is viable in the long run yes and that yes. shows human intelligence. It actually. does, it, yes. It was fantastic. So you have the business development side of things, which is great. And I think that all of the new technologies and all that must be turned into new companies that will create wealth, that will create jobs, that will make people happy to work for what they do rather than feeling bad because the waste streams are bad and all that. Third point that I think is very important is that we need to engage the younger generation, not only millennials, but children to yes. be part of that process now. Yes. Uh, we cannot wait until the tools are ready and the strategies are ready and then we say, okay, come in guys and you will do it. They have to be part of that because they, they yeah. think more positively. That's simple. And in different abstract open ways and uh, if the parents and the teachers and the communities can help the young kids care more about um, Kimball, Kimball Musk's uh, initiative with the learning gardens is yes, really interesting. It's fantastic. I love that. Yeah, fantastic. hopefully we get some of that in Europe soon. Well, we're actually, um, we're now organizing a very important conference in Athens in October 2018. What is the uh, conference? And the conference is co-organized by our center in The Economist. Oh, sweet. Um, and oh, that the, great. it's about sustainability. Awesome. So, and actually, Kimball is invited to speak. Oh, that's there. great. I, I hope he will make I it. Hope he does um, too. We are in touch with him. Yes. We have some, some good relations. Um, but, you know, his program is like crazy. Mm -hmm. And so, if he manages, I want him to come and explain exactly this. Yeah. You know, how you get the, uh, the people that are genuinely interested or can become genuinely interested, and especially younger generations, to be part of the effort. You don't have to convert them. You yeah. just have to show them that it's done. And it's fun. And then they take it on their backs and yeah. they start running, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. So, Learning gardens are super fun. You yeah. just, they're right out there. They're doing it as part of their daily excitement and they're learning and they're growing food and then they're tasting it right there and and it's a whole ecosystem of love and understanding for the planet and I, I just I'm really happy what is the, the conference will be in October you said it's on the first and second of October in Athens, we are in Athens. and what's we it are called? very it is the uh, sustainability summit sustainability and, summit. and it's cool. sustainability summit for southeastern Europe and East Mediterranean and awesome the region. Um, Hopefully, we, uh, simulation can go. And uh, would love <laughs> to have you there. Would love to have you there, guys. Uh, the, the president of the Hellenic Republic has put it under his auspices, so he will be doing the opening of the event, which is great. That I mean, if awesome. you have the head of of a state yeah. putting so much attention into sustainability, it's good news. Yes, and um, we're really grateful that he he chose to do that. Of course. Yeah. Um, but also we're trying to get people across the board. I mean, there will be a couple of people that we had hunted here at COFES and they will mm -hmm. be speaking about AI, big data Good. management and so on. We have a session about sustainable finance because this is a very important thing, how finance is a driving force for business 
can change the way that business operates. You were and, mentioning that earlier, sacrificing a little bit of profits to invest into a sustainable yeah, business exactly. rather than one that's not. That's so cool. There was a head of, uh, of a big, very big company who was saying that sustainability is not a case of just doing your rightful thing for society or the planet. It's a matter of survival of the company. Because in the long run, if you're not sustainable, you will be deleted by the system. Yes. So, you know, it's just self preservation, self, you know, saving your own existence actually mm -hmm. by being sustainable and that's very important. Um, we, we try to focus on the things that can really make a difference and they are the issues that are the agenda of tomorrow. I think that um, we cannot, I don't remember who was who said that, that we cannot just ge keep on giving old problems new names and think that we're doing something about it. We just have to put down the agenda and say that yes. we have to move forward with that, yes. turn the page and in involve all of humanity in trying to change that. Option B is a very bad one. I mean, if we don't address climate change, uh, we all know that it will not end up well for the human species. If we don't ad uh, address ethics or morality exactly. as a society, especially exactly. with AI and bio-warfare and all these Very new, important. Yeah. And that's why I, I, I was just saying that in, in the COFES uh, conference, that we have a chance of turning AI into the best partner or the only partner that humanity has if it wants to go into the sustainable way. Yes. So let's try to focus on this rather than using AI in every other stupid possible way that we've heard many people, you know, giving warnings about how it could turn sour and all that. Um, I want to ask you about yeah. this before we move on. Um, how does AI leverage machine learning on a data set in transportation or a data set in the food vertical? How do they, how would an AI learn in those verticals and then how would it, are we talking about things like when the farmer finishes growing their batch of produce and then the AI already knows that the vehicle should be there at this day of the week and that then at this time of the day and then it ships it to the store and then from the store then mm -hmm. we're able to run data on when the person comes and purchases that item from the store and when they go home and eat it and that way you know that it's fresh and that it's and that it's not one third of the food isn't going to waste. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of how we're thinking about analyzing it's the It's many different ways. One way is, uh, let me give you a very practical example. Say that we currently, if, if you see how the food distribution system goes, is uh, say we have a farm and we produce, I don't know, one ton of tomatoes, then this thing we can either sell door to door to our neighborhood which is not a very big scale model and it's not really a sustainable thing if you want to, to scale up. Uh, or otherwise, we have to go through the central markets, sell it to the, um, to the big scale uh, wholesalers, and then they will go into distribution. And in this process, a lot of food will be wasted. Uh, a lot of energy will be wasted for moving all these things around yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And we lose something which is very very important, which is called traceability. So mm. the thing that we will buy to eat or feed our children, we do not really know where it comes from, yeah. what it has inside and all that. Yes. One way that AI and, and uh, new technology can help is, for example, blockchain. Yep. So if you try to manage the whole food stream through blockchain, that means that at every step of the way, there is some landmarking of what happened when my food was produced. Correct. And then it also allows me to buy directly from you because I can talk, contact you through this chain mm -hmm. without having all the intermediaries in the process. This saves a lot of money, increases the quality and saves a lot of, of wasted otherwise food. So this is one way that it can yeah. happen. Um, another way is that if you want to plan for your agricultural policy as a country or a region or a state, it's very important to be able to digest all the information of what is happening with production to correlate that, for example, with weather patterns and yeah. weather predictions of what will happen so you know when the supply of food will be there and arrange it in, in relation to demand for food so you do not have the waste and all the things that will not be purchased and will rot on the, on the shelf. If you know it's going to rain at 2 p.m. tomorrow, you should make sure your water system doesn't go off at 1 o'clock. Exactly, that exactly. Day. Yeah. and we have had a case like this. I met in, uh, in a fantastic program in Australia called Innovise. We met a couple of young scientists um, who were devising a system of how irrigation for, for grape 
uh, grapes for, mm -hmm. for wine production should be done so that in water scarce areas you do not waste water just yes. irrigating your grapes. And yes. That's simple. And it's, it was really a very simple applet that they created with some, some technical appliances. And it was saving, I don't know, 20, 30% of the water that was going there. Awesome. Huge. Yes. Huge. So you see, there are many ways. I mean, yeah. you have AI coming into the, uh, the, the policy perspective of things. So you integrate all the information. You have practical ways of, of making sure that the flows of goods are happening in a way that is much more sustainable. And then you have practical tools that help you manage your resources in a much better way so you don't waste water, you don't create waste that, that will just go to landfills, as we were saying before. I mean, it's, it's endless. And I think that this is the beauty of it, that, that new technologies create a whole new world of possibilities that we can use for turning the page for humanity. Yes. So Spiros, do you think that moving forward that we'll have both uh, leveraging AI across all these different verticals and trying to have them talk to each other like a human body would from its birth form rather than trying to build up first and then talk. Uh, and then do you think that this review system will be in place as well? So moving forward, are we going to have sustainability goals be reviewed across countries uh, and also leveraging the um, AI tools? Is that kind of what we're thinking? Probably yes. Probably yes. I mean, it's not... Uh, a necessity to have the cross-referencing, but I think that because we'll be hopefully working with artificial intelligence, there has to be an iterative way of re-educating and enriching the knowledge of the system, which is our best, best partner. So AI has to keep on learning how this thing is done. If we don't do the reviewing, we're l losing all the, the um, feedback and refeeding all this knowledge into the system. I was yesterday discussing here at Coffees with somebody and uh, we were saying that there's a very interesting um, difference between how technology is developed because technology in most cases has an incremental progress. So you know you have one thing and then something else happens and all that. Policy is not like this. Policy development comes in very big chunks. It's yeah. like monolithic boom comes boom. there, is yeah. there for the next 20, 40, 50 years. Um, and one of the problems with policy is that to this day, humans do not have ways of refeeding all of this knowledge, historical knowledge. Yeah. And this is why we say that history repeats itself. If, if we could refeed all this knowledge of humanity into history, mm -hmm. it would not be repeating itself <laughs> and having, you know, one war and then after so many years have another war and all these stupid things that happen mm -hmm. with humanity. So we're hoping, and I'm hoping that by actually doing all this, this review of what is happening, we will be able to learn along with our tools, our technological tools, to not do the same stupid thing again. Yeah. And actually lead to a very, very high rate of evolution of the human species on, on the Earth, but with a much lighter footprint on the Earth at the same time. Ooh, high five to that. I love <laughs> it. That's good. Yeah. And we're ready for that hockey stick of human evolution. We we're, should be. We're, we're <laughs> we <ready>. better be. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for it. And, and information technology should be advancing us faster uh, to get there. And it has been. Um, but many people talk about how in the 1950s there were so many people saying that, oh, flying cars are right around the mm. corner and all these other kind of things. And, you know, why didn't we get there? Why didn't we get there? What were the reasons why? Look, I, I think you can always look on the positive, you know, the half empty, half, half uh, full yep. bottle. Um, if you think the, the, the changes that happened in the last few centuries, you had uh, typography, you had television, radio, all the media and all that, um, they did lead also to a lot of, you know, fake news and, and all that stuff that we have and, and over uh, burdening humanity with information and all that. But at the same time, the educational effect that has is come amazing. through is amazing. Yes. I mean, yes. humans, if you go two, three centuries back, did not have one increment of the capabilities that <laughs> yeah. we now Literacy have. Literacy was way less. Yeah. Um, so now, things, if yeah. you choose to use those tools in a stupid way, of course, they will backfire on you. And that's why I'm saying, and we are saying here, that it is up to us. I mean, what we will make of AI, we design the tools. 
it's nobody else. I mean, they don't come from, from the sky. We design the tools, and if we put an objective in designing those tools to help those efforts that humanity has to make to have a better future, we're doing the right thing. If we don't... Okay, here's, here's a good question for okay. you. It kind of leads us down some of our more simulation questions. Um, the question is, a lot of our efforts is about, okay, we designed this tool. This tool is designed into the world. But then the follow-up question is, what do the people use the tool for? Mm -hmm. uh, do people use genetic engineering to create uh, augmented intelligence? Or do we create bio war weapons for bio-warfare? So then the question becomes, do we... Was it, was it, does it, we need to make some objective code in the tool that prevents people from making biowarfare? Or is it have to do more with this inner management? This taking right. a step? Uh, that's, that's a million dollar question. Do it's, you, it's do not you, what easy do you to think? answer what, what do you think, I though? think that humanity is not inherently either stupid or bad. I think that, that humanity has a self-preserving... Um, uh, talent, let's say, or, or you know, a thing yeah. that keeps it ticking. Um, and I believe that we will see some of that stupid stuff happening, obviously. I mean, you cannot help it because we, we've seen it with past technologies. You see also the bad part of that. Um, How but can we prevent more of the bad from happening? Through inner management or through the code or through what? I think it starts with inner management. Yeah, I, think I think it so starts yeah. with what you have inside your... your, 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 your your uh, soul, your your psyche, as we yeah. say in Greek, you know, it's yeah. a, it, it it comes from from your own existence and what you want to be at the end. I mean, if yeah. what you want to be is creating a mass destruction systems, uh, then you're not really a human person. Uh, but I think that. Or your rewiring re was off when you were a kid. Something was wrong with your yeah, love exactly. and your compassion, whether it was from parents or from community or teachers or whatever happened at that young, those young ages. But you see, it's 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 a value system at the end of the end. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a value system because if your values are about making humanity better, then you will be investing all of your efforts and your work into that that positive thing, um, and that's the biggest challenge for humanity. I mean, we have to have the right set of values there. Yeah. And I think discussions like those that we have at COFES should and very often were actually about the value system that is behind all that um, in many different ways. But at the end of the day, there was a lot of talk about, you know, humanity and the values that we need to serve through that and, and on. To me, that was a very good takeaway. Well, Spiros, okay, let's say from your perspective, you have, you have a good amount of understanding about the importance of these sustainable development goals, the importance of humanity collaborating. How do you see humanity working together in the next decade or two? Right now we have China has the largest AI budget, Russia saying that oh, whoever wins AGI is going to win everything. Uh, so how do, you, how do we work together? What are the steps we need to take to, to work together? Um, I cannot predict how we will, but I can tell you how I propose that we, we put that into implementation from our side at least, which is that we want to work with, with um, technology architects, so people that will be building the programs and yeah. all that, that, that technology that needs to be put in place, to help them understand what are the big questions and then they can quantify it. They can put yeah. in a program the uncertainty parameters. They can put in a program how you will be able to crunch all this data to produce something useful. And the point here is that if we expect the machines to help us ask the right questions, uh, we are wrong. The questions have to be put there by humans. Because technology the architects plus big questions. Exactly. I love that. And humanity <laughs> puts the questions and technology does the processing yeah. because humans cannot do it and should not do it. So if you blend those two together and yes. then you turn to the audiences that are, as we said, the children, the investments uh, community, yes. the business, the politicians, then you start building something that is quite different from all the governance system that we had in the world yeah, so far. Yeah. So you actually create the new era for humanity. And probably it sounds a little bit, you know, uh, dreamy and, and too visionary, but I think that... We have to try. Exactly. We have to try, I mean, yeah. Who do we have to blame if we don't try it? We can imagine it, we should try to do it. Of course. 
And I think I think we sell ourselves short so much. So many times we say that oh, it's not not possible. Ideal governance systems not possible. We haven't tried. We haven't tried these sorts of uh, potentially uh, u- utopia. Doesn't mean utopia for everybody in one way. Yeah. Utopia can mean for you one utopia. For me, different utopia. But some maybe some basic rules like. We shouldn't kill each other. Okay, great. We agree. Awesome. Yeah, Move start on. from the basics. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you get the scientists working with the business, working with the politicians, working with technologists? I love the idea of the of a governance system working on those principles and putting the te- um, technology architects with the big questions. Look, a lot of what we do on this show is the big it is, questions. It is, and I love that. That's why I wanted to be here, and thank you very much for having me. But We love you having see, you. I think that, I don't know how it happened really, that all of the countries of the world agreed to, to, to have the SDGs in place. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, sometimes jokingly, I say that probably they didn't know what they were voting for. They had not totally understood. But, and it's a joke, but I think that um, we have a unique opportunity in the history of humankind because we now have an agreement around this visionary, utopic, if you like, thing. But it's there. I mean, it's agreed by the UN. Never before in the history of humanity did we have that. So if we don't have it now and we don't start working on that, it's it's a wasted opportunity, and I, uh, for one, I'm not prepared to waste an opportunity like that, because you know everybody loves their kids, yeah, and that's why we should be doing it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because you want to pass down a beautiful world to the next generations, one that doesn't uh, yes. have, one that has less problems, one that has more flourishing over and over again. Every generation should be making it better. Look, one thing that we we see very often now is that you have millennials and even younger generations now that. Um, are very different from how we were. Uh, They have a different concept about what work is, about what their objectives should be and all that. And this is not happening by accident. It's happening because the system's value has changed around the world and they do not exactly see where they will fit. So I think that we don't just want to give them a better world, but we want to involve them with all of this question marks that they have around them and the way they see the world to be the ones that will drive this process. Yeah. They, they can start now and would just, you know, put the tools down there like parents used to do when we were kids. They would give us the Legos and we'd just sit there and create something and a little bit of guidance, but then it's, it's them yeah. that do it themselves. And yes. this is what we should be doing. Just build the tools and yeah. let them play with yeah. the proper guidance and change the world. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I feel like we're, this is exactly what Ron and I have so many conversations about kids and the importance of uh, having kids be... Children. I don't refer to them as kids. I never have. I refer to them as children. Why? Why? Because kids is suggestive that they may be sheep. A kid. Oh. Well, my English is not that good. A kid is that of a, it's a a slang term for a a goat, no? I didn't even know that. No. Okay. Children. 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 Children of the earth. Children True. of the earth. Right. And so we, we have so many conversations about children and the importance of children retaining the sort of creative, uh, loving characteristics that mm. they do from birth into the world. And, uh, you know, Picasso talked about it as well to retain those childlike characteristics through adulthood. It's so important. Which I think is very important also for another reason. Um, There is so much talk that, you know, with AI and automation and robotics and all that coming through, uh, humans will be out of a job. They will not (laughs) be able to do anything. We could all be children again. (laughs) As we said before... um, And the spinach will just fly in and land on my plate. Which is okay. I don't have anything against that as long as I know where the spinach is coming (laughs) from and if it's good. But we said before that the artificial intelligence will be crunching the data and providing the answers, but humans have the intuition and, and uh, talent and, and you know, the, 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 the human part of the equation to ask the right questions. So yes. I think that we should also be making sure that all of these talents that children will have need to be amplified as much as possible because this is the only thing that will protect humanity from losing its own creativity and possibility to be working. Because working is something that defines people, defines humans, and it would be a very bad thing, I believe, 
to think that we can have a society without work because yeah. machines will be doing everything. So, yeah. but work has to be around intuition, about talent, about, yes. I mean, yes. music and painting will never be done by machines, I think. Uh, music in the sense it's already of, you know, being done by machines but in the sense but of, have you listened to it <laughs> <laughs> we have we had someone on our show that made it ai yeah song grading ai and it was uh it was pretty good it was good yeah it yeah. was good but, the, but this is the thing is um if you look at the the future of humanity uh, as a as somebody needs to be in the driver's seat of the ai um i wonder who's going to be in the driver's seat of the AI and I think there's many people here that we've talked to as well that are that are very aware of what's going on around the world with things like IP theft from China mm. and things like um, w w what is the reason why that is happening um, is it just for the horizontal globalization or is it so that there can be a vertical spike in terms of one country and so that way there can be an sort of a domineering right. force. So I, I, I frequently question what's actually going to happen with uh, wealth inequality, mm -hmm. with uh, the, the benevolence of the people that are the technolo technology architects. I like how you said that they have to be paired with the big questions, but then they also have to be paired with inner management mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the technology architects and the people posing these big questions have to be very grounded into ecology and into the harmony of all the plants animal species on this planet as one and being. the other things that you said like equity equality sorry between humans and uh, respect of human values and all that this is part of sustainability you cannot have yeah. the one without the other because it leads yeah. to inequalities it and to imbalances that at the end of the day will turn over the whole thing the whole construct i i I've, i'm very I think about this a lot because there are I, I frequently speak with people that are both liberal and conservative because I, I really enjoy their both of their perspective mm -hmm. circles and and I speak with free thinking a lot and so because I go through all these waves I see that conservatives have a tendency to think that it's okay and this is a tendency but have a tendency to think that it's totally okay to speciate, as in it's uh -huh. totally okay for there to be a hyper-rich and for there to be right. a hyper-poor and that for, for the hyper-rich to advance as the better species. And the liberals tend to, again, tendency, tend to think that uh, that that's not okay and that it's important that we funnel a lots of our resources into the bringing the poor up and actualizing them and try and lift rising tide all boats for sure all no matter what and so uh, I, 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 I that thought process for me is very important because we're approaching it in these next couple of decades and I'm very hesitant to be uh, I, I want to be a voice of, of reason, of concern, exactly. of conversation and, around the planet. And I for think this. the only way one can answer such big questions is by being very pragmatic. Um, I would think, and I would, I would vouch for the uh, option that says I'm not taking any side because I am I'm trying not to be politicized in that because yes. it's more important than just politics. Yes. Uh, but I think that if you manage to empower humanity as a whole, in the sense of having good health, good quality and all that. That means that you have a much better control of what humans do in terms of population growth. You know, population growth is not happening at, at crazy numbers where you have good education or good health. It's happening in the places that do not have good education or good health. So yeah. if you want to contain population growth by by people wanting to be part of the containment, then you have to provide the means. Um, if you want to have people better their livelihoods for the benefit of all, they have to create more value added. And this is by training, by providing the tools, by also investing in, in those societies. So I think that it is to the benefit of humanity as a whole, even of those that want to be on the upper, you know, one or two or three percent with a very, very big wealth, because it will always be that. And there's nothing wrong with that, really. I mean, yeah. some people will be super rich, fine. Yeah. That's not a problem with me anyway. Yes. Um, but it doesn't mean that this has to, to all step on, on a layer of misery of humanity, because that actually will trickle up. It, it will trickle up and there yeah. will be some sort of 
problem that arises from it. And personally, because we I, all I, we all live in the same planet, you know, <laughs> we all do, and it's all a shared ecosystem. And so this is why, even though there's no problem with somebody being hyper rich. I, I do think there begins to be a problem when that person is trying to buy as much land as possible, buy as many boats and watches and all these materialistic possessions as possible so that they can do things like rent seek or do things like try and be conspicuous with mm -hmm. their consumption and stuff like that because those things actually don't advance your soul. Yeah. They don't advance your soul. No, and that's very important. That's, yeah. that's hugely important because I think that humanity and, and humans are losing their their raison d'être, you know, their reason of being. Yeah. If if all you are about is the make of your shoes and how many pairs of shoes you have and how big is your boat and how big is my boat, yeah. I mean, there are other values. Uh, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you take if you take two children that are you know very young and they have not had the time to be influenced by all that, and one of them comes from a mega rich family. And the other one comes from a family of immigrants that are dirt poor and they don't have any way. And you just let them play together. Yes. They will never speak about their parents' yachts. Yeah. Never. Yeah. They and will if find other, yeah. other qualities, you know. Yeah. yeah. And if maybe the young one would be like, uh, uh, oh, we have, you know, a boat. And there's, oh, what's a boat? Oh, boats yeah. this. You want to come look at the exactly. boat? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of having yeah. the big walls up. And these are the and values we have to build on. Yes. I'm glad we touched on that. How about we touch a little bit on, um, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, look, I have been thinking about that quite a lot. You know, I'm, I'm Greek, so philosophy is part of what we all Bloody. do you know, in our DNA. <laughs> DNA. But um, I think that there is no reason why we would be alone in the cosmos. Uh, I'm not talking metaphysical, I'm talking really practical, practically, whether there are other creatures in, in the, the uh, universe. Um, I think that there is no reason why we should be the only living thing on that. Yeah. But then again, I mean, this is a discussion that can take many different ways because mm -hmm. scientists say that there might not be just one universe, but many parallel universes. Correct. So there you have it. I mean, the, again, the uncertainty levels go very high <laughs> to be able to uh -huh. say. Um, but you know, we have a saying in, in my country that before you start looking what's happening with the others, try to put your own house in order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think this is what you should focus on. I love that one. That's been a key in our lives uh, with Tony Robbins, with Jordan Peterson, with these figures that speak about cleaning your own room, yeah. taking care of yourself, Swami, Ananda, inner management, spirituality, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Um, I'm glad that that's... A f so yeah. what, do you think that there are advanced civilizations that maybe roam the cosmos and colonize the cosmos? Do you think that that already exists? Why not? Why not? I mean, I, I cannot say that there are or not because I should know something about it and on yeah. a cognitive level I don't. But on, on a probability level, why not? I mean, I'm not so selfish to think that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the evolution of, of of time and space decided that it only wanted to create Allen and Spiros, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And only this earth, exactly. And only yeah. this earth. Yeah. But then again, um, you know, the best thing we can do is to try to be a really evolved species. Uh, because if and when, if that thing exists and when it decides to come our way, we better be a very evolved thing if they yes. are evolved enough yes, to come yes. to us. Otherwise, I mean, we will be the underdog of that thing yeah, and you yeah, don't yeah. want to be that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be their food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yes. Uh, the evolved, we, we should do our best to be as evolved of a species as possible. Do you think we're in a computer simulation? No. I you think, think so. this is base no, reality? No. no, this is base reality. I don't think we're a computer simulation. I don't think that we are a dream in somebody's mind. Um, Why? Sorry? Why? Why do you think that? Um, that's, that's a good question. I think this is, this is a bit egoistic, actually. I think because we have all these feelings that we share among us, and this cannot just exist in a dream. You know, a dream is a thing that takes a very little bit of time, and it can be interrupted and start and stop in any time. I think that humanity has so much richness in, in everything it carries with it that uh, it would be very demeaning for it to, to, to think that it can just exist in somebody's dream or somebody's... Uh... One thing that, yeah. that, on the contrary, I have been contemplating with very much, it started by reading a book by Isaac Asimov mm -hmm. a long time ago, 
is that the evolution of humans could at one point go in a direction where we remain humans in our souls, very humans, but we are less and less attached to the physical part of human being. Definitely. Which is fantastic. Digital consciousness. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's not digital. That's, that's my thing. I mean, mm. you become a very conscious thing, but you become mostly unrelated to your physical, physical part, body, which yeah. you, you need less and less and less because yeah. what matters in humanity is, yeah. is what we think. Yes. And that could eventually, after I don't know how many millions of years, become the evolution of humanity to be less related to, to, to the material part. And that would allow, of course, humanity to expand in the rest of, of, of the universe. Yeah. Because you don't have to carry your physical part with you. You just carry the, uh, the mind part. Oh, I'm so excited for my soul to just be able to exactly. go... Exactly. And just like have... 25 more senses that I'm sensing the universe with at one at one time and dimensions and dimensions do you what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world um I think it's my daughters but <laughs> uh, the most beautiful thing in the world is I think it's love it's it's really unbelievably strong this thing and um, I think also it's creativity if the, the, what you feel, you know, the thing that gets you from your guts and drives you even if you're down and out and if you don't have the means and everything and you feel the push of creativity inside you and you pick up yourself and go on for it again. This is unbelievable, the strength it gives you. And I think this is what has helped humanity come up from, from its shambles every time. And I think it's, it's magic. Awesome. I love it. Spiros, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. This I really is, enjoyed that. This has really been such a that. pleasure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been super fun. Yeah. I'm really happy you had a good time. I hope that maybe if it works out that we can uh, come out. But well, I will send you the information. Uh, yeah. I will send you an invitation and would like you to come and cover the event. We would we love have to. have very interesting people there. You can get interviews from all of them and uh, maybe not to. the president of the republic. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, would love that because, you know, you share what you do with a lot of young people. And uh, I, I really care about what young people think. And if there's any feedback that we should be sharing after that, once you air your program, I'd, I'll be very happy to take into account yeah. anything that we do. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, for all of your thoughts, especially around sustainability and being a voice for a reason around that, around the world. That's very crucial for us moving forward. Um, guys at home, ladies at home, if you guys had a good time, uh, please give us a like, comment, subscribe. Uh, share the content with other people. It's really important for us to share the message, especially of sustainability, talk to each other about it. How can we move forward? Uh, how can we provide a better world for our kids and their kids and keep moving on and evolve more as a species? You heard what Spiro said, if you want to become a patron and help us get to his conference and help us pay for our rent and all these important costs that we have. Join us on patreon.com forward slash simulation series. You get great exclusive benefits. Big shout out to Kofez for having us. Big shout out to Ron Vargas, our producing partner. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in and we'll see you guys soon.